Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our weekly COVID-19 virtual town hall brought to you by Coos Health and Wellness today. It is myself, Eric Gleason, as always, with the epidemiological master, Brian Leon. Yeah. And the always lovely Barb Young as our American Sign Language translator. We worked we worked diligently on the audio uh, this week so that we didn't have the problems that we've had uh, all of the other weeks. So our audio should be good and hopefully we don't have any problems with it. Um, we're just really going to kind of chat tonight, I think, about whatever it is you guys want to talk about. We've had some questions that have been submitted through the COVID19.questions at chw.coos.or.us email. Uh, we can go through those. Uh, as always, you are welcome to actively ask questions in our live chat. And uh, Brian and I will just kind of try to address everything that we can. We haven't really had anything exciting happen as far as knock on wood. <laughs> As cases, as no. far as cases, no, no, things been pretty, um, pretty mellow lately. Good news. It is good news. Um, I like when it's uh, when it's quiet. Uh, we are a week and a half into phase one, with about another week and a half uh, possibly to go for us to maybe slide into phase two. Uh, the, gov the governor's office and OHA should have some guidance regarding that coming out hopefully tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Um, oh, uh, this is a good question. I don't even know if we have an answer for it. Uh, Joanna, Joanna says, I know people are getting invites for the key study. How big of a commitment is it to be a part of it? Wow, that's a good yeah. question. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily know that it would require too much of a commitment. Um, I, I believe there's just going to be a, a general agreement that they can use your biological data in this case as, as part of their study. Um, there will be information. There'll be information to um, read as far as your informed consent. I, I, I believe they're just gonna need a, a really quick uh, sample and they'll, I'm assuming they'll probably provide a way to, to get that sent in. Um, yeah, with, without <coughs> reading all the specifics, I couldn't be sure, but I, I don't believe that's gonna require much of a time investment. All right. Yeah, I can't imagine that they would uh, want to to make it difficult for you to be part of the study, right? I mean, they're going to want to try to take the the stress out of it and and make it easy enough for people to participate, or they're not going to want to participate. Right. Uh, Arnie has a question: Any advice for people traveling to Lane County for doctor's visits? No, that's a good question. I, I would say probably the uh, the same advice that we would we would typically give as far as when you're out in public, um, just being extremely careful about keeping your social distance, um, you know, wearing, you know, a mask when you're out in public, uh, wash your hands thoroughly, try and not to touch your, your face or anything like that. Even, even with the mask on that could eventually, uh, end up causing some transmissions. So just all, all the advice that we, we normally give. Yeah. Well, ultimately the, the, Preventative measures are the same here as they are in Lane County, as they are in Multnomah County. Um, ultimately, main, try to main, maintain that social distance and, and uh, hopefully um, everybody at the doctor's office is doing the same thing. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. All right. Let's see what we had for some questions over the week here. Um, oh, the age old Shutter Creek question. Um, <laughs> We're beating a dead horse on this, but I think that it's it's important because people are still really worried about that being the start of our our whole series here. Ultimately, was what happened up there. And uh, Val says there's 31 COVID-19 cases listed for Coos County. How many of those are Shutter Creek inmates or staff? How many are not related to Shutter Creek in 
uh, in any known way. Yeah, so 28 of those cases are related to Shutter Creek in some way. Um, three of those cases are not, at least that we know. Uh, Dan, Dan has a, a, a follow-up question regarding that um, that kind of segues nicely in there. Why is it that the Coos County continues to report those cases um, from Shutters Creek when they've been transferred out of Coos County? Yep. Um, communicable disease reporting for the state of Oregon uh, will continue to follow the same pattern, whether it be for COVID-19 or salmonella or the plague. Uh, and that is going to be that the, the case belongs to the county of residence where the person lived when they uh, were sick. Um, the cases don't move counties as the individuals themselves may may leave the county or, um, you know, whether they eventually come back or not. Uh, that that is that is a pretty pretty consistent feature of communicable disease reporting because a lot of the epidemiological um, observations that we want to be able to make is is where the individual was exposed, right. not not where they currently live in the moment. No, and that's and I think that's an important point that uh, people don't realize is that it just how that works right. from the communicable disease. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. To be clear, that is not something specific to COVID nineteen. That is that is something um, very common with all of the reportable diseases that we uh, report on here in the state. Uh, Tom's got a question regarding our last case that we've talked about in the media recently. Mm -hmm. You know, the the, the 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 question really is, why weren't they tested uh, earlier? Yeah. Uh, so I, I do believe that we did comment in the media that there was uh, certainly going to be a period of time where we felt they were ill, where some of the symptoms did match up. Um, you know, we weren't involved in the decision about whether to test or not test. Uh, we can tell you that the, the individual certainly would have met the testing criteria that was in place at the time. Um, but ultimately, it's, a, it's up to a provider to order that test. And it's up to the individual to... Um, to agree to be tested. So um, we can't really go into any more specifics than that, but um, for whatever reason, they were not tested. Um, yeah, and early, early in the process, there was a lot of questions, you know, I would imagine from a lot of people that were just trying to make the best decision they thought they were making at the sure. time. Hindsight, Always Looks 2020. Rough. Yeah, <laughs> right. For sure. Uh, Judy says, of our, with our 31 active cases, are all of these cases still active? Um, are the people still ill from the virus? And if not, who reports the changes in their status to the Oregon Health Authority? And why have the changes in status been reported? Uh, why haven't I'm guessing that that's what it probably okay. means is probably wanted to know uh, some places report or I think OHA reports uh, recoveries mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily yeah there's also been I think some comments that uh, one one particular outlet in the media mentioned the words active cases right. uh, when reporting and that's not that's not entirely that's a little bit misleading so um, I, I would say that there are individuals at the state level. Um, I don't know how consistently, um, but they, there are individuals that are contacting cases throughout the state to get an idea about what their current symptom status is and use um, a certain criteria to determine whether or not they would consider that person recovered. Um, that, that is not something we do locally, and that's, that's likely a big part of why um, the Oregon Health Authority is, is uh, using that statistic. And, and as far as I'm aware, none of the uh, local counties are. Um, I, the, the word active will certainly be addressed because that I think for a lot of people that read that word or hear that word, they think that that means that is also trying to discuss whether or not someone is infectious or whether they're still sick. Um, 
so yeah, the, the word active is not exactly um, accurate there. Uh, we, we basically say we have 31 cases, whether they're active, recovered, sick, infectious, that, that's not trying to describe any of those subcategories. And we're currently not um, working on reporting that locally. Right. Um, Keith would like to know, would it be possible to state where all new cases are located? I'm not asking who are, let's see, I'm not asking who are in this position, like what city zip code basically, which there is a, wasn't the state was starting to report cases by zip code or groups of cases by zip code, weren't they? Did they continue to do that? Uh, I believe that's still a weekly report they're putting out on Tuesdays. Um, that is that is certainly something they're welcome um, to put out there, but there are a variety of reasons why that's not something we're going to do locally, either by a town name or a zip code. Uh, we have several uh, places here in the county that have a, a pretty small population, um, and and we're just not really willing to right narrow it down to go into that specific and and have people start kind of playing. Uh, private investigator trying to figure out who it is sorry <laughs> we're, we're certainly trying to protect people and their and their medical information uh marianne says i'm an in-home healthcare worker mm -hmm. i want to find out if i can be tested so i can keep my employer safe please let me know if and where i can be tested in-home healthcare worker yeah, so she, uh, yeah, I'm guessing she goes in and takes care of her client, whoever okay. that person is. Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, it, still at this point, um, any decision about being tested is between you and your primary care provider. If if you don't have one, you know there are resources, you know, through the respiratory clinic. Um, I cannot see that phone number from here. Uh, the hotline. Uh, yeah, the hotline. it's the uh, the community COVID nineteen hotline is five four one two six six one six five zero. Right. Okay. So they so they will be able to to kind of steer you in the right direction as far as um, potentially being tested if you do not have a primary care physician. Stan wants to know where the nearest testing center is. And so there's a lot of them. <laughs> there, there is a lot of them whether or not uh anybody will just be able to utilize the closest one to them is, is another story right however uh again we'll fall back on the answer to the last question you would want to contact your uh primary care provider or um use the phone number that eric just rattled off to talk to somebody if you don't have one 541-266-1650 uh, that being said, we don't just have walk-up testing available. Like that's that is something that's not uh, not available now, and, and it may not be available soon into the future. Right. Right. Just the number of tests that would be needed for that uh, don't don't exist right now. I'm getting some feedback about our uh, feedback our about topic. feedback audio sound issues, potential static. You're not hearing anything, see? Okay. Our our uh, our audio visual IT guy over in the corner with his headphones on. <laughs> okay. Speaking of uh, our town hall, it, I believe we're going to be transitioning into a every other week town hall approach to where we do the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. As things have slowed down, um, I think the need to do this every week is also slowed down. So we will still be con conducting these, but we will do them uh, a little more spread apart than every week. Yeah. So um, some of these questions are paragraphs. <laughs> Haley well, a lot of my answers are in paragraphs. Eric. I understand. No, I that's true. 
That's true. <laughs> If this was uh, transcribed, <laughs> the transcriber would have quit week two. <laughs> Some of your Sorry, answers. Uh, Haley says, our organization recently purchased N95 uh, masks from SOWEB to use when employees are working in the field and for use when we slowly return to the office. Are these masks reusable? Do you have any guidance you can share about these masks as well as cloth masks that I can send to our employees? You know, I would, I would like a little bit more information about your organization um, to, to get an idea about what type of interactions you'll be having with each other and with the public. But um, uh, keep in mind N95 masks in order to be effective the way they're designed need you know, the individuals that are wearing them need to be fit tested. Um, as far as reusable, um, again, that kind of depends on the context in which they're being used. Some, you know, there are, because of the shortage over, over time since the beginning of COVID-19, there, there has been guidance from the CDC that has described um, using them outside of the normal uh, protocol, which, you know, basically saying, Hey, you can just use one all day long, but that's not been normal. The, the normal period of using those is when you enter, say a, a patient's room that, that you're wearing it for, and then discarding it when you leave that room. Um, but yeah, I, I would say there's, a, there's probably a lot of missing, missing information there to, to be able to discuss exactly how we would recommend use for those. Uh, I'm assuming there's some type of healthcare worker if they've acquired yeah. N95s, um, in which case there will definitely be CDC guidance on, on the appropriate use of, of those for healthcare workers. But um, the, the bigger thing is going to be being fit tested. If you're not fit tested to wear one, I mean, you might as well just be using a, a normal cloth mask or or a procedural mask. Right. Which um, guidance regarding those that she talks about. I mean, ultimately it's, it's how to properly wear them, right? We've mm -hmm. got that information on our Facebook page or not on our Facebook page. Well, I think it is on our Facebook page. We've shared it. Uh, our website is on the COVID-19 page. We have some uh, tips for how to wear your mask. Uh, don't wear them with your nose sticking out. Don't touch them. Don't play with them. Um, there is, there is a way to recharge your N95 masks or have them disinfected, but it's a, I think it's an expensive process and they're, I think it's by, uh, for specific groups, uh, mostly healthcare uh, related. Um, and I mean, would it, would it be safe to say, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that it's still smart to even in a mask six feet, not a, not an, not a one or the other, but a both kind of approach, even with the N95. Because like you said, if you haven't been fit tested, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily know if it, it fits perfectly. You still want to maintain that social distance mm -hmm. if at all mm -hmm. possible. Yes. Absolutely. And and the decrease in social distance in the event that you were just passing someone, mm -hmm. that's not like the big deal. It's the no. being within six feet of, feet of someone for 15 minutes. Right. Right. And or I think direct patient care, which is sure. one of the reasons why we were wondering about which organization, what kind of organization it was, but yes. Well, because I know that uh, you can go to the store, right? And say you're trying to walk down the cereal aisle and someone is, has apparently misread the, the direction of the arrow on the floor. And so if you're trying to pass each other, there's this like, you know, as you're, as you're trying to figure out who's going to go first, um, you can pass each other. Just don't, just don't hang on. Uh, the question on the live chat is why not N99 and P100 masks? Do you know what that means? Nope. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know what those, those masks are. Oh, N95 equals 5% leakage. Oh, I'll be darned. That's a good question. I will ask our liaison, uh, Philip Nell, uh, tomorrow and see if he has an answer for that. Um, if you would want to email us that question at covid19.questions at chw 
www.coos.or.us. I can also forward that on to him uh, and maybe he can answer that um, in a timely manner. That is a good question. That is a good question. Um, all right, let's see. Find another paragraph here. South Slough Reserve has received approval from our Salem office to move forward with having summer camps for kids starting the first week of July. With this approval, there are several items we need to make sure that we are keeping up with all the restrictions in place due to COVID-19. Attaining safety and cleaning supplies throughout this time has... I think that that sounds got come off. So some of the items we're looking uh, at need to include hand sanitizing stations, hand sanitizer, hand washing stations, soap, mask, gloves, no contact thermometers, et cetera. This list is currently not all inclusive and our final planning continues. We will most likely be adding more items. All right, that was a statement more than so a question. There was a question mark in there? No, <laughs> there wasn't. I think, uh, I think that, um, that brings up a good question though. You, you we're, we're walking right into summer mm -hmm. and things like the South Slough Reserve and having their summer camps, which have been a staple in, in some kids' lives. Like they, mm -hmm. they love to do that kind of stuff. Uh, July, we should be into phase two. Think. I think we'll, yeah. Even if we move into phase two, we can't move into phase three without a uh, vaccination, right? Mm -hmm. So, Phase two, we're still waiting on what that guidance looks like and what the numbers can be in a setting that you could still manage to have social distancing in. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that if, if organizations like this are going to start doing these things, the thermometers and sanitizers, all of those things in order to keep uh, the staff and the students safe, I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean there's anybody that's going to have a hard time maintaining a lot of the advice that we give for staying healthy and reducing the risk of transmission, it's, it's going to be the kids. So they, they need a, they certainly need a lot of help and making sure that they've got everything that they need to uh, follow through with some of that advice. No, absolutely. I, I mean, we are going to have to learn at some point what life looks like as we live with COVID-19. Right. It's a new paradigm. Right. So it, it, we aren't going to have the ease of access to things that we used to of just like wandering through a, a door and <laughs> walking into a building. We're gonna, there are going to be things that we've got to go through, right? And, yeah. Um, it's going to be like uh, airport security everywhere we go. But it's, <laughs> it's I mean, it, it's going to be where we're at. That's, that's, the, that's the world we're going to live in until we figure something out regarding a vaccine or. Yeah. Yeah, it could. I, I, I certainly am prepared for for normal day to day life, even after everything is basically open, for it to certainly undergo some adaptations based on our current reality, for sure. Right. It's going to be. It is going to be uh, the new normal, mm -hmm. and we're never going to go back to normal. Yep. We need like sappy music right there <laughs> as we stare into each other's eyes. soundtrack yeah um yeah. so the 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 uh n99 p100 mask question um he's actually filling up the the chat with a lot of really inform interesting information so cloth, cloth masks are n3 per a british study I'm fascinated when, when with the things say, that are being typed in here. But when we say X percentage of things being let through, what are what are we describing? Really? I'm guessing like, though, yeah, like, like everything down to I don't know, uh, you know, less than X amount of microns. So in other words, some in some cases, right. not even organic matter. Well, but what we've what we've known since the beginning is that wearing masks wasn't to protect you, right? As much as it would to protect the other person, right? Unless right. unless maybe you're wearing an N95, which right. which is to protect both people but if you're wearing a cloth mask or a um the, yes. the other ones yes um uh, those are just to like knock down those, the those are a barrier for our own respiratory fluids to keep right. from getting out it's like shutting the screen door mm -hmm. you might keep most of the flies 
from getting in, but some are still going to get in. For sure. Um, no, this is very interesting. Thank you for putting this information in here. Um, it it uh, it is helpful. It's nice to have that kind of information out there. Um, Felicity says, "I'm a Spanish interpreter and a member of Oregon Interpreters in Action." As you may know, most interpreters are independent contractors. Many of us are in need of PPE because we work directly with patients and are not sure how to obtain it because the places we work often provide PPE only for employees. Because this is a concern, we've heard that many interpreters, we have been doing our best to connect interpreters with resources where they live and work. We've heard from a few interpreters working in Coos County, so I'm wondering how would an interpreter go about Making a request for PPE in Coos County, uh, where should I direct folks working in the area? That's a that's a pretty good question. I, I I would think in a scenario where, say, a hospital or or a clinic was asking an interpreter to come in to directly address one of their patients, that they there certainly would be some allowance for protective equipment to be provided, but. Um, I don't really know for certain that that is that is the case. So that would be something we would need to look into. I know that the guidance um, that came out with or pre phase one, as we were jumping into phase one, what we needed to be able to do is that most places were going to have to source their own with the exception of um, certain groups that mm -hmm. like say county would take care of are supposed to uh, be mindful of the first responders mm -hmm. while hospitals and clinics are supposed to man uh, manage to get their own. Uh, uh, that is a great question, Felicity. I mean, where do we, one of our staff members, uh, Pam uh, Lewis, she went out this last, was it last week and was putting containers out in front of all of the city halls mm -hmm. in Coos County so that people could deposit cloth masks as also as they could go and get cloth masks for themselves if they needed a cloth mask. Um, whether or not a cloth mask makes the most sense in this situation, Felicity, I don't know, but um, this is something that I think we could definitely uh, look into trying to figure out what an answer might be for that because that is a really good question. There are a lot of people that start, well, at work in close proximity to patients in, in, in avenues maybe we hadn't really considered. That's a really good question. It's a really good thing to be brought up. Uh, don't doctors and nurses deserve better than 95%? I agree with you. Uh, I don't, I don't. I, I think we're kind of veering into a little bit of a space where we're not 100% sure that what's <laughs> right. being put yeah. out there is all right. As appropriate to the topic. Where am I? Robert says, way back in winter, before COVID-19 came into our lives, I booked an Airbnb in Coos Bay for the weekend of June 19th. I recently contacted the owner of the rental and she stated that we shouldn't be concerned about still coming up, but I wanted to double check with a representative from County Health. We would be coming up from Sacramento, California and have been in our own shelter in place order since mid-March. I was hoping to check with you to see what the current situation is like in Coos Bay, what you think it could look like in a month and what you are recommending when it comes to our to out of town visitors. One of the reasons we chose Coos Bay was to check out the town as a potential for a retirement home, but more importantly, to see someone, some of the beautiful coastline and the state parks um, are in the area open and accepting visitors. Um, well, Robert, that is an interesting question. It's, I mean, I there's several points of that probably need to be addressed. There's a lot. The travel itself, right, coming from Sacramento would be, I think, at this point, ill-advised. Currently, currently, mm -hmm. it would not fit in the uh, guidance right. that we are aware of as far as non-essential travel, right? which would be uh, definitely a shorter distance than Sacramento, California. Did, did he say what day in June? Uh, 19th. So, so However, that could, that could change. Mm -hmm. By June 19th, we could be into phase two that has a little more relaxation, but I still don't know that it's going to be I mean that that's a that's a really good question. I would say in June nineteenth, 
uh, it, we fly into phase two and we know a little bit better what that guidance looks like, we could probably have a better answer. Um, based on the guidance right now, it wouldn't uh, make a lot of sense. But I think in two weeks, three weeks. It could be a whole different, whole right. different game. And, and that's the same thing as far as cases. You know, right now there, there are not um, many cases that are uh, not connected to Shutter Creek Prison. And so um, one could certainly make the argument there's not a lot of community transmission cases and, and, and we're a little bit lighter than a lot of other areas in the state. But uh, to expect that that is going to remain consistent in a month, um, that, that is a pretty serious roll of the dice there. I, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would think it seems like um, they are the person that wrote that question are, are already kind of looking at some of the resources available, just trying to get an idea about what the situation is. I would, my best recommendation would be to continue to do that. Keep checking right. state parks website, um, county parks website uh, to see about uh, adjustments, you know, the state of Oregon's, um, you know, governor's office, as far as travel, uh, could just continue to monitor those, those resources. Um, but as far as cases go, I mean, even just a few small cases has the potential to potentially grow quite a bit in just a couple of weeks. So that's not something I would really feel comfortable about guessing about at this stage. No, you're absolutely right. And more and more of the county and state parks are opening um, to visitors. I know the county parks have uh, had RV camping every other space. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was it was initially just county um, campers, and then it was neighboring county campers. And I want to say that we're looking at they're looking at it opening up uh, even further as this process rolls out. So I would I would assume if everything was going just like this on June nineteenth, we would be in phase two, and everything would probably be a little more lax. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you said, Brian, that could change in in a day or two days. Mm -hmm. But those are very good questions. Uh, can a business refuse customers that will not comply with PPE or social distancing? Will the police get involved? I would hope that the police don't have to get involved in any of this. I think a business, I mean, Costco is refusing people from entrance uh, to their facilities if they're not wearing a mask. I think that it's harder to police the social distancing aspect because people will be milling about in a store right. depending on what the business is. Right. But I think based on the owner's discretion, they could say you can or cannot come in here without a mask. And we've, how many, how long has it been since, you know, stores have had signs saying no, no shoes, no shirt, no service. I mean, I, I, I think as long as, there's yeah. not a discriminatory aspect of, of certain groups of people. You have the right to ask uh, everybody that comes into your to store or, or whatever type of business it is to, to be wearing a mask. No, that's absolutely right. Um, if, if you're asking it the same of everybody and you're exactly. telling them, hey, sorry, um, then you should be able to refuse the right to serve those people or allow them in your I would certainly recommend having uh, a stock of some of the things that you want. Um, there, there certainly are people that may have not figured out exactly where they can get a cloth mask and yeah. have a hard time finding out um, where they can purchase or may not have the money to purchase. Um, so it probably wouldn't be a bad idea that you have something available potentially for the few people that haven't been able to access. Yeah. No, it'd be nice to have have that. Uh, I mean, if it's, if you're going to make it a requirement, that you can at least help until they get used to the uh, idea of it. Yeah. Um, I know that we had some emails this last few days, uh, or I guess mo mostly today, but o over the holiday weekend of businesses that were not following their own guidance mm -hmm. as far as the there have been strict guidance set forth for specific sectors that employees and uh and the such are supposed to be wearing masks right and that's not happening in a lot of places uh, and the, the question is to whether or not there is any uh, uh teeth to like the, that guidance as far right. as like is someone going to come down and do something about it um osha will i know that much yeah if if it becomes seen a, a problem and, yeah we've yeah we've seen at least one example where osha will come down and say 
hey, you're not doing what you're needing to do. Now that hasn't happened since it opened, since right. phase one opened. Right. But I would imagine that they are uh, open to the idea. Mm -hmm. So it just makes sense. It, it just, I mean, please follow the guidance because ultimately we can't continue down this path of the phased reopening if we don't all work together to make that happen. Because uh, all it takes is, is like you said, Brian, a few cases that snowball into something major where we have to go backwards. I mean, we've seen a few reports here recently where in other counties where they've had a, they've already had a bloom in cases because a bunch of people got together for family gatherings. Um, and suddenly, you know, there was one small town in central Oregon that popped like eight cases over the case, over the course of a week. Um, because, and, and basically all of them are traced back to uh, a couple of just small social gatherings, people that, you know, normally would have been, um, under the, the original, you know, pre phase one staying apart. And then, you know, as we start opening things up, I think, you know, we've talked before about a false sense of security. People are like, okay, yeah, now I can go out, but you gotta, you gotta keep doing the things that were, were keeping us safe to begin with. Yeah. I saw a lot of that mm -hmm. this weekend, just that it, you go out and people are milling around. They don't, nobody, very few masks mm -hmm. and, and uh, real close uh, proximity to each other. And yep. I mean, we, we're not, this isn't over. Nope. And this can only really get worse if, yep. if we don't do the things that we need to do to keep each other safe. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that we can figure that out well before uh, we're forced to figure it out. Because yep. um, that, that's not a situation we want to get into. That's exactly right, Eric. I mean, I don't want to. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, well, National Recreation Area is open soon. Um, our beaches and access to beaches open. Uh, do we know if any farmers markets, uh, roadside stands are open? I know that the Wednesday market, I think, is opening in a few weeks. Um, I want to say it was the 11th of June. I know that those are going to start working on opening up, but that would be phase two. And I mean, if, if you look at the date, beaches are open. People are, well, they're going to the beach. I think that they're open the day uses are of the beach. Um, yeah. I can't I, speak I, to I, national I don't parks. Know if, yeah, I was going to say, I don't know. Some, some beaches, maybe state parks some beaches maybe yeah county parks i think maybe. most of our yeah most of our, our beaches are state parks I think. Yeah. yeah and i know that people have been out walking their dogs and milling around yeah you know ultimately if you're going to go out we still you still need to maintain that six foot social distancing unless it's people that you've lived with in the house right? yep uh arnold says state parks are planning on opening june 8th all right uh, this question is about the casinos and have we asset has the health department uh, department assessed uh, the mitigation measures that are being used at the casinos and even though their their tribes have sovereignty state gaming commission regulations require a safe environment for patrons and employees um, I no. <laughs> I, I don't know um, what the state, I mean, Rick, I'm going to look, I'm going to look into that one. And, and I would imagine from our standpoint, maybe, maybe Rick has done some uh, uh, health inspection stuff, All right. you know, but I mean, as far as the gaming commission and that, I mean, we're not going to have any part of that. Um, and they are, they have sovereignty. They, they mm -hmm. wanted to open and, and they, they did. So, um, I will see if Rick Hallmark has anything to say about that. And I know Rick, that you emailed this uh, to us. I saw it in the uh, COVID-19 questions email, and I will forward that to Rick Hallmark and, and see if he can get me an answer and I'll email it back to you um, so that you have a more thorough answer than uh, what gibberish that was. <laughs> I was just losing track of the Ricks, to be honest. Right. Two Ricks. Um, 
It's six oh nine. We've gone through all of our questions. This is why we have to do every other week or uh, yeah, the second and fourth Friday or Friday, not Friday, Tuesday. <sighs> Doing great. This is why we can't have nice things. This is why we. I would like to say that we've had better audio this time, though. So, I think so. Yeah, we've had a couple complaints, but nothing too bad. It does help if you have them on the right channel. The microphone's on the right channel. I did find that out. Um, do you have a question, Steve? Let me repeat that question. So the question was um, from our IT guy, Steve, um, in the back of the in the back of the room. He said, "What's the what, what's the odds that we have a surge or an uptick with all of this?" You know, I can use this opportunity to go into one of my uh, essay long uh, answers. Let me grab your soapbox. And. Uh, I would say the risk of transmission is always going to center around a few factors. What is the current prevalence, which means what are the numbers of, of cases where an individual uh, in this scenario, what it would mean is the number of cases that um, an individual is likely to come across uh, where that person is infectious. Right now, we think our prevalence is pretty low. We haven't had very many uh, community cases. Yeah. So, and in addition to prevalence, we would uh, then add what are what is the proportion of our community residents where they are uh, actively abiding by our um, recommended guidance in terms of social distancing and um, all, all of those things. Um you, you know, hand washing everything. Um, some of the places that you interact with, what are the chances that those um, places are being regularly sanitized? And, you know, because we know it's not just a direct person to person transmission sometimes, sometimes it's person to surface, surface to person. Um, so that is also very, very important. Um, and then of course, in addition to the fact that we're opening back up and um, folks from other parts of, uh, from other jurisdictions are starting to come and visit us. Yep. Um, that is certainly increasing the likelihood that the prevalence number may not be what we think it is when we talk about a, a snapshot of who is in the area right now. So even if we just have a few community cases and uh, a bunch of people from Multnomah County where there's been, I'm not picking on Multnomah County, but any, any county that has, you know, quite a bit more cases than us, if they wanted to visit and go to the beach, that that is also increasing the risk. Um, yep. I, I wouldn't want to apply a particular number in terms of odds, but I would say uh, the risk of us uh, having more cases and then having those cases bloom um, based on all these factors is, is certainly a lot higher than it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, for sure. So that's something, that's one of the reasons why um, contact tracing capacity has been a big topic and part of uh, the plan to reopen. Right. Um, because as we're doing all these other things and making sure that we have hospital capacity in the region, making sure that we have uh, appropriate amount of PPE for our healthcare workers on top of all those things. Uh, we're essentially saying we, we expect there to be more cases and we just need to be able to jump on those cases and uh, do our isolation and stop the spread as soon as possible so that three don't become 27. Follow-up question, Steve. Yes, go ahead, sir. Mm -hmm. then would that help reduce the chances of this spread of people are outdoors more and outdoor comes in and out for, for those that may not have heard Steve is this a seasonal mm -hmm. thing can this can this change via, via the seasons right like I 
I think the the season is going to help us, but maybe for not the reason why some people may assume. A lot of people were asking early on, you know, as it gets warmer, is the virus going to have a harder time, um, you know, surviving or or anything like that? There's there's no um, reason to believe that an, an additional ten or twenty degrees of temperature is going to uh, stop right. the virus. However, um, we know that uh, just because of you know, weather and wind and, and a few other things um, that just the, just the sheer transmission from person to person is, is going to be more difficult as more people are spending time outside versus indoors. So um, right. we, we could see the fact, you know, uh, all other things being equal, it wouldn't surprise me if a theoretical transmission in June, the transmission rate would be a little bit lower than you know, something in February because there are going to be more people outside. Right. Cause if, if the outside temperature had a lot to do with it, I mean, you have to think about it. We live in Coos County, mm -hmm. 72, maybe mm -hmm. during the summer, if right. we're lucky, right. At least here, maybe Coquille is a little bit warmer. Myrtle point power is a little bit warmer. Right. And then, but if you're here in the Coos Bay North Bend area, we get a lot of wind. It doesn't very, it doesn't get very hot there are plenty of places right now that are warmer than we are going to be during the summer that are still having right uh, yep. transmission of the COVID-19 yep. virus. So absolutely. But, but yeah, I, right. you know, yeah, people, people just being outside more. I mean, there was, um, God, I just read this a few days ago and I can't remember the country, but they did, they did a study that, uh, you know, we, we still want people to social distance and, and do all those important things outside. But there, there was a study in one country that was done um, where, where a, a pretty small proportion of the cases that were transmitted that they could identify what the route of transmission was. Very, a small proportion of those were out, outdoors versus indoors. So hmm. um, it still can be transmitted outdoors. You can still, um, without that social distance or without mask wearing there still is the potential to transmit but i think it's fairly straightforward that the risk isn't quite as high uh even just the fact of high touch surfaces i mean if, if right. you're out and about on a park um just the lack of high touch surfaces means that there's going to be a lower chance of transmission which is one of the reasons that cities have taped off their play structures mm -hmm. because right. of that Yes. Right. We, we at Coos Health and Wellness have someone that walks around and disinfects. However, right. when you go out, that's why one of the preventative measures was, you know, before you touch your face or do anything like that, hand sanitizer, wash your hands, right. do those things. Right. Because you don't know who else is taking those measures, right? And you have to protect yourself because you don't, you can't assume someone else isn't taking the precautions for you. Yes, especially when you walk around and see that there are, are certainly people that are not taking precautions right now. Right, right. The only one that can protect you is you. But however, that being said, we should want to hopefully look out for our community and the people that are in it, right? Because a healthier community usually would result in healthier you, right? Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can do this together. And we're going to keep pushing that and pushing that and pushing that is we can only stay open if we work together to do so. Help keep Coos County open. Whoop. No, it's seriously what it is. That's, yep. that is, and, and it's not just us. It's, it's every county in Oregon, mm -hmm. every county in the United States, we all have to work together to stay healthy, to try to keep this curve down and be able to move forward and get to whatever our new normal looks like. Yeah, we let Steve talk, and now, now he's just he's yeah. Uh, you know, floodgate is open. You know, I think maybe Steve should replace you, Eric. I think he's got you some really think, good points. Yeah, yeah. Just, no, just that's true. I'm just no, that's true. He probably you. should replace right. me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it the mask thing. I know. You know, it was it was a lot like when we had to start taking our our bags in. Right. Right. Like, oh, yeah, forgot my bags. Yeah. Um, 
but in that case you had that was only five cents yeah. per bag right yeah. you yeah. forget your mask if and it's going to cost you a little more than than a, than a nickel mm-hmm. um but it's all just something it, it's getting used to doing something is when they changed when they made it a lot of wear your seatbelt took a while for people to remember dang i gotta i gotta wear my seatbelt yeah, yeah. 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 No, I had that. I had that happen the other day and I was like, I walked in the store and went, Oh, I don't have my mask. And then I was just trying to hurry to get out of the store. Cause I'm like, I don't want people to. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll be, well, that's where we're at. Well, hopefully I, I, I hope that you feel like, Oh man, I didn't wear my mask. Not everybody's going to be that way. Position, man. No, not it. You I always have your mask. mask. I, I mentioned about having two brothers that live in two different parts of the world, one in New Jersey, one in Shanghai. Yeah. And, and it's just the variation of norms. People wear masks. Yep. And yeah. In New Jersey, they don't. But he's seen a big paradigm shift where especially yeah. with the seating, everybody wears masks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
those rules and ethics have been put in place for a long time. That's not information that we, that we share. So. Right. Well, and this has spurred some collaboration between community partners and things to get more contact tracers in when, um, yeah. it's with Quebec and so we have been yep. and getting uh, people in the door to, to help us add to our contact tracing ranks and, um, it's been a big help. It really has. Well, you know, the whole, the whole thing, this whole thing has really brought, uh, first responders, healthcare community, other community partners really together to try to work yep. to move our county forward in the right, you know, through this, this, uh, pandemic. And, um, if there's one positive thing to come from this is, is the building relationships that weren't, it's not that they weren't there, but they are far stronger now than they, than they were. That muscle is getting exercised. It absolutely <laughs> is. It absolutely is. It's, uh, it's nice. We, we have a, we have a small community. I mean, Coos mm -hmm. County's 64,000 people, right? I mean, and to be able to get those groups together, though, the help, the hospitals, the clinics, the first responders, um, small business, uh, all of the community action, mm -hmm. everybody together and on the same page to progress forward and, and move towards a goal is, uh, it, it, it's got to be easier for us, you would think, yeah. um, than in some larger uh, metropolitan areas. But it still needs to be practiced. Yep. Even though we're closer, we're smaller, it's easier to get to the people we need to get to. We still need to practice what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And I guess this has given us a lot of practice. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot of people in this community that wish they didn't know me nearly as well as they do. I know for a fact that people are tired of seeing my name in the newspaper. <laughs> I'm right there with you, Matt. <laughs> I think uh, Stephen Googled my, uh, or not Googled, but looked my name up on the world website and it was like 65 articles or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've had, I've had people walk up. Are you the Eric Gleason we see in the paper? I'm like, oh. I, I'm the only one here. So <laughs> that is me, but it's good. I mean, we, that's another relationship that I think that we've really, improved on and and I've been working with our meet local media for a while but the relationship we now have with the world and KCBY and I mean KDOC KDOC Mike and and Stephanie have been uh, uh very supportive in in my role as PIO for a while and and um trying to make sure that they get all the everybody not just them but all of the media sources try to get the right information out yep and they they've done a great job that that is a, a wonderful resource for us to have and relationship that we've built. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there's not a lot of communities that have that kind of relationship with their local media, but again, that comes from having a small community. We don't, we don't have a lot of them, so it's easy to get to know them. It's easy to, to build a rapport with them and really work as a team to get the community, the information that they need to get. I think they really understand the gravity of the situation too. Yeah, I really do. I really do. Which is, which is really important. Yeah. You know, it is, it is, mm -hmm. um, it's super important. Um, when's the next one of these going to be? Let me look at my calendar for two those of you, today. for those <laughs> two weeks from today. Two, two weeks well, from today. yes, in this case it is, you're right. So we're going to do the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month. We're not going to do them every week. Um, as much as we like to sit here and talk with the community, um, I think that we can reduce the number of them from where we're at right now. If there's an uptick, then we can, we can pick them back up as needed. But I think second and fourth Tuesday work. So that would be uh, June 9th for all of you keeping track. It would be our next... Um, virtual town hall so please uh, submit questions that you have to covid19.questions at chw.coos.or.us and we will um, pick those out so we can try to answer them um, again we don't have answers for everything but we're going to try as well as you can always uh, ask, ask questions in the live chat so two weeks, everybody. 
we hope you have a safe two weeks. Um, hopefully when we speak in two weeks, we're in phase two and we can discuss a little bit more about what that means for us because I think 21 days would be June 5th. Um, we can have a little chat about that when that's all said and done and hopefully um, everybody stays safe. So until then, we will see you in two weeks. Uh, good night, everybody.